In Venezuela, representatives of political parties and former presidential candidates continue the process of appearing before the Electoral Chamber of the Supreme Court of Justice to present the minutes and evidence of the electoral process of July 28th. In the United States, the current president, Joe Biden, has stated that he is not confident that there will be a peaceful transfer of power after the presidential elections in November. And Nobel Peace Laureate Muhammad Yunus arrived in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, to take over as the new leader of the interim government in the country. Hello and welcome to From the South. My name is Belen de los Santos. I'm from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Venezuela, representatives of political parties and former presidential candidates continue the process of appearing before the Electoral Chamber of the Supreme Court of Justice to present the evidence of the electoral process of July 28th. From the headquarters of the judicial entity, former presidential candidates attended to the call of the Electoral Chamber after the introduction of the contentious appeal by President Nicolas Maduro for the investigation of the electoral process. Since its beginning in the morning of Tuesday of Wednesday, the opposition candidates Manuel Rosales, Jose Luis Cartaya, Jose Simon Calzadilla, Luis Parra and Chaim Bucaram have already appeared before the Supreme Court of Justice. So far, Miguel Salazar, Mario Valdez, Bernabe Gutierrez, Pedro Beliz and Jose Brito appeared before the highest judicial authorities to face the hearing process. Here there is a very great contumacy, a very great rebelliousness that could lead to a repeated mandate of conduct against Mr. Edmundo González Urrutia, who is also deeply irresponsible with the country, a person who issues a communique but goes out to hide. This is irresponsible before a country that is demanding at this moment to be able to resolve this issue and to be able to present elements, and that today the Venezuelan people are being denied the possibility of being able to resolve this issue through peace through the path of reaction, through the path of sosiego, and we have to denounce it as such. In the opposition sector that claimed fraud in the last presidential elections in Venezuela still does not present the evidence of its accusation despite having the institutional and judicial means to do so. Let's see the details with our correspondent Lionel Retamal. As in any process, the accusation of fraud or irregularities must be proven. The only proof presented by the opposition sector is a website where they uploaded a percentage of the total tally sheets. The star test loses strength a little more than a week after the controversy. Even more, it turns against them, because its veracity has been criticized by Chavismo and other opposition sectors. Those who denounce fraud are the fraudsters, says this Venezuelan lawyer. For instance, I make use of an accusation by accusing the other. This is when, as a very important example, the thief starts shouting, catch the thief, so that he can escape justice and escape from the pressure he could be victim of. This is what is actually happening. We have the fraudsters shouting fraudster at the other. The fraudador gritándole de fraudador al otro. According to Venezuelan law, his actions and statements may be considered a crime, since they usurp the functions of the electoral power, without considering those already initiated by the prosecution for the acts of violence and the calls for rebellion by the armed forces. This is the crime of usurpation of functions. This is an attack against the republic form of state because the democratic system is being undermined. There is a self-proclamation that is nothing more than authoritarianism and dictatorship. But there is also a series of crimes that have been planned behind them, which are crimes of violence, people have been murdered, people have been assaulted, public roads have been obstructed, public and private properties have been damaged. Even by like-minded sectors such as this leader who attended the electoral inquiries of the judiciary. Because the only institution authorized to carry out the process of justice and authorized to carry out electoral processes, totalize, adjudicate and proclaim is the National Electoral Council. 
the judicial process that is underway is not a challenge to the process, but a power of the judiciary to investigate and confirm the process at the request of the winning candidate. This instance has also been ignored by those who denounce fraud. They do not know it precisely because they do not have the evidential capacity to go to the court to deliver the tally sheets that they have. Because all the tally sheets issued, the tally sheets issued by the electoral machines are delivered to the witnesses of each one of the participating parties. The judiciary's inquiries continue while the country gradually returns to normality. And now let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English where you will find news in different formats, news updates and much more. We'll be right back, stay with us. Welcome back from the South. In the United States, the current President Joe Biden has stated that he is not confident that there will be a peaceful transfer of power after the presidential elections in November. The U.S. President affirmed that the Republican candidate is serious after affirming in his speeches that there would be a bloodbath in the country in case he loses the presidency. Furthermore, the head of state denounced that Trump has not given a clear answer when he asked if he would recognize an adverse electoral result. Biden also denounced the actions of the Republican-controlled Georgia State Elections Board, which voted this week to give local officials more power over the certification of election results, claiming that Trump's formation seeks to undermine the popular vote in presidential elections. If Trump wins? No, I have no confidence at all. I mean, if Trump loses, I have no confidence at all. He says what he means. We don't take him seriously. He means it. The whole if we lose, there's going to be a bloodbath. It's going to have to be a stolen election. Look at what they're trying to do now in the local precincts where people are counting the votes, or electing, or putting people in their place in the states that they're going to count the votes, right? You can't love your country only when you win. And in this context, Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris and her running mate, Governor Tim Waltz, framed the election as a fight for freedom, bashing their rivals Donald Trump and J.D. Benz as they take the stage in Detroit, Michigan. Let's listen. He intends to surrender our fight against the climate crisis and he intends to end the Affordable Care Act. You know what? If you want Donald Trump to win, then say that, otherwise I'm speaking. Think about what that means when he said that he will even, quote, terminate the Constitution of the United States. Because let us be very clear, someone who suggests we should terminate the Constitution of the United States, should never again stand behind the seal of the President of the United States. Now we move on to other topics. In Australia, a group of scientists reported that the Great Barrier Reef is in danger due to increase of temperatures in the oceans. The experts analyzed the samples to measure ocean temperatures in 1618, taking into account that this reef is the largest living ecosystem in the world and that it contributes more than $4.2 billion annually to the country's economy. The results show that temperatures began to rise in the 1900s as a result of human influence. The scientists emphasized the importance of their conservation, pointing out that these corals are home to thousands of species of fish, in addition to representing a great source of tourist income in many countries. That we should be extremely concerned about 
uh, the future of, of the reef as we know it. Because, yeah, we know corals can recover from a, a bleaching event, but when you keep having repeated events over and over again, you really test that ability to recover. And, uh, you know, these corals have lived for 400 years, and this is the warmest temperatures they're experiencing. And, gosh, I just feel like these are, these are the redwoods of, of the, the reef. So we need to be um, really um, respectful of, of those as, as creatures as well. And in the Brazilian Amazon, the first station recorded in July, the first advance in 15 months. Among the factors contributing to the July increase, according to the government, was the strike by public employees of the environmental agency IVAMA. The July increase interrupts a sequence of 15 months in decline, but if the last 12 months are taken into account, the reduction in the forestation compared to the previous period was of 45.7%. In this context, Environment Minister Marina Silva in a press conference in Brasilia after the presentation of the results referred to Lula's policy on the forestation. Upon taking office, President Lula prioritized the agenda of zero deforestation, not only for the Amazon, but for all Brazilian biomes. This implies creating plans to prevent and control deforestation, not only for the Amazon, but also for all Brazilian biomes. And in other news, one of the most symbolic sites in the history of the 20th century is Lenin Mausoleum, located in Moscow's Red Square, which recently celebrated its 100th anniversary. Our correspondent Oleg Yasinski tells us about it. 100 years ago, on August 1, 1924, the mausoleum where the embalmed body of the leader of the world's proletariat, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, rests, was opened to the public. Solo él, el único en el planeta. He alone, unique on the planet, and for the first time in history, succeeded to excellent education, a strong state, and the power of the People's Council to make the world society work for communist ideas. Comunistas. Tras la muerte de Lenin, el... After Lenin's death on January 21, 1924, architect Alexei Shusev was commissioned to build the mausoleum where Soviet scientists Alexei Vorobayev and Boris Svarsky embalmed the body. For example, in the year 1924, when Lenin died, there was no television then. Almost nobody knew what he looked like physically. Most of the peasants were still illiterate. They didn't even get the breast. They remember how Sholokov tells that in the Don region, they say that Lenin was probably a Don Cossack because he was very brave. The Buryats believed that Lenin was a Buryat because he cared about them. And then they really filled the leadership of the country with letters, explaining that all the people wanted and demanded to see him. Since it was open to the public, Lenin's mausoleum has become a major tourist attraction for people from other countries, and some even consider it a pilgrimage site because of its profound significance. More than 130 million people have visited the mausoleum since its creation. Let us not forget that it was on its walls that the Nazi flags were thrown when the Soviet Union liberated the world from the Hitler plague in a gesture of having fulfilled its duty to him. La figura de Vladimir Lenin. The figure of Vladimir Lenin in history for me is very important. I study at the university with historical archives and Lenin as a great historical figure deserves a good tribute. In this year of his centenary, Lenin remains one of the greatest historical figures most remembered through the years. His legacy to the working class in power of the struggle of the peoples of the world for their liberation continues to be a reason to study his work that is already part of the heritage of humanity. Oleg Yasinski, Telesur, Moscow. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Tales for English. There you'll be able to re-watch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings and more. 
Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. In Spain, the Parliament of Catalonia held the investiture session of the socialist Salvador Ilia. In parallel, the former Catalan president, Charles Puigdemont, returned from exile after almost seven years and could be arrested by the authorities. From, arrested by the authorities. from Barcelona, our colleague Andres Flores brings us more information. Exactly maximum tension here in Catalonia where all the focus is on the investiture session of Salvador Ilia of the Socialist Party. But however also the protagonism at this moment has the former president Puigdemont who reappeared in Barcelona after crossing the border without being arrested. We are talking that after six years and ten months Puigdemont has returned to Catalonia. His intention in principle seemed to be to participate in this plenary session of investiture. But however for the moment everything is uncertainty, and it is not yet known if he will finally be arrested, if he will be presented on the spot. There was an event organized a few hours ago near the Triumphal Arch here in Barcelona where his supporters have demonstrated in favor, and the idea was also to generate a climate where he could walk those 1.3 kilometers that separated him from the place of the event to the Parliament of Catalonia where it would be held, where the investiture is held. This investiture that has 135 votes in principle, and it is necessary for Salvador Ilia to get 68 votes to be invested. He has this number, yes, it is a very tight number. He has them with the support of Esquerra Republicana de Cataluna and also with communes. But nevertheless nothing can fail in this account because if some of the deputies have some kind of disobedience or do not comply with the pact this investiture would fall. We are living moments of great attention and of course we will follow it very closely in this key moment of politics here in Catalonia. And in other news, in the United Kingdom, thousands of people demonstrate against racism. Led by activists on the association Stand Up to Racism, among the participants were members of the Muslim community, migrants and refugees. The demonstration took place in a calm manner in different cities such as Bristol or Liverpool. However, in some cities there were sporadic tensions between anti-racist and anti-migrant groups. The government of Keir Starmer had ordered a heavy police deployment with 6,000 troops in case of possible disturbances. No, this protest, this this counter demonstration, it was peaceful. We're here to say that we're, you know, we're kicking fascists off the streets. We're standing up for our communities. It's not to incite violence or hatred. It's to come together. And I think people need to understand if you're coming to protest against anti-fascism, against anti-racism, you need to understand it's not about violence. That's what the fascists want. They use violence because that's the, what, that's the only thing they have. For a bit of context, let's recall that for the past week, the United Kingdom has been experiencing violent protests, which the government claims are extreme right-wing protests after three girls were murdered in Southport in the northwest of England. The violent protests were fueled by false information about the identity of the suspect in the crime, presented as a Muslim asylum seeker, but the alleged guilty is a 17-year-old boy born in Wales. More than 400 people have been arrested and 120 charged for the riots, and some have already been sentenced. And on Thursday, Muhammad Yunus, the Nobel Peace Laureate, arrived in Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, to take over as the new leader of the interim government. 
The move follows the resignation of former Prime Minister Sheikh Hashem Hashina after a student-led uprising ended Hashina's 15-year rule. In this sense, Yunus is expected to take over while his government's main objective will be to restore peace in the country after the chaos unleashed by the students' protest and the violence of the clashes against the authority that left 400 dead. It is worth mentioning that Muhammad Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize for funding and designing the Grameen Bank to fight poverty in Bangladesh in the year 2006. And the Nanjing Museum in Yangsu, China, is hosting an exhibition on ancient Greece to celebrate the Olympic Games in Paris. The exposition, entitled The Glory of the Aegean Sea, the exhibition of ancient Greek civilization, displays a collection of cultural relics related to the first Olympic Games of ancient times. The exhibition includes around 270 pieces, including two bronze discs, which reflect the rich Olympic history of almost 3,000 years ago. Visitors have expressed their admiration for the uniqueness of the objects on display, which presents shapes and sculptural patterns different from those of their culture. The exhibition will be open until October 20th, offering a unique opportunity to experience the cultural legacy of ancient Greece without leaving China. And like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesorenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesor English, my name is Belinda Los Santos. Thank you for watching.